I want to thank everybody for joining tonight. We're going to do a uh, special broadcast. We've been doing some studies. We're going to kind of give a little bit of time to for some people to start connecting and getting in. But at the church on Wednesday nights, we've been doing a series where we're slowly working our way towards uh, the book of Daniel. And then also we're going to be moving into the book of Revelation. And so recently I opened up for discussion for some questions to be asked. And one of the people in the church asked the question, connecting, asking about demon possession and why it seems so different in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Why didn't we see demons being cast out in the Old Testament? And then when Jesus comes on the scene, it seems like he just, there's multiple instances where he's casting out demons. And so that's the main plan and objective tonight is to try to answer that particular question. Now, as I began to study a little bit more deeply, um, I ended up finding some clarification for some things that uh, I had been kind of curious about. And so I want to also address uh, those instances also. So, you know, one thing, though, that I, that I wanted to point out is, is that we've been laying a foundation for this teaching on Revelation. And a lot of it is interconnected to what we've been talking about, Mystery Babylon. We've covered uh, demon demon origins, where they came from with the Nephilim. We also covered territorial spirits, um, how in certain areas uh, the, the occultic activity was was very powerful and strong and that how that was going on in Bible times. Um, we talked about Ephesians 5 and how, I'm sorry, Ephesians 6 and how you know, the Bible tells us that we're at war, not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and uh, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, cosmo craters, which the word means world rulers, and how we used evidences of two kings, uh, princes in Daniel, uh, the prince of Persia and the prince of Grecia, and how they were fallen angels, and how the idea behind that is that these world rulers are fallen angels and powerful demonic beings. And the reason that I'm trying to build a foundation as we get into that, because even last night we taught on Elijah and we talked about the spirit of Jezebel and where we ended was in Revelation 17. And what we see is this harlot that is interconnected to the to a beast and that this harlot and this beast system working together in unison have been deceiving the inhabitants of the earth and caused them to become drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, whenever people are drunk, they can't see, they can't hear, they don't know where they're going. That's the purpose of this beast system, to cause great confusion and delusion in the people of God. And so again, I know that a few more people have chimed in, and we're going to go ahead and kind of just keep moving. Uh, so uh, the main thing again was to answer the question that the, per the gentleman in church asked. And this was, this is how I posed the question. I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but it's something to this effect. Why is it that we don't see demons being cast out in the Old Testament? And then suddenly when Jesus shows up, he starts casting out demons left and right. And so, again, we're going to try to answer that question tonight. There's a simple version, and then there's a longer version, but nevertheless, I'll try to give you both. Uh, we're going to be mostly using two main passages of Scripture, Matthew 12, 22 through 45. That's Matthew 12, 22 through 45, and then also Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 20. Now, maybe before you came on is whenever I was originally saying that but I began to study to try to find the answers to this, and I began to dig deep, more deeply. I believe that I kind of found some clarity on some questions that I personally had in the past. And um, some of those questions were, for instance, so did the Jews, because you'll see where I'm going with this. It's in the passage of both Matthew and in the book of Acts. So did the Jews cast out demons or not? If you've read your Bible and you've studied the book of Acts, if you've studied, you know, the Gospels, then you had to have come across this yourself. And I'm sure 
that it was one of those times where maybe you just kept reading and you didn't completely understand it because I know that I've wrestled with it a little bit. So did the Jews cast out demons or not? And if they did, was it the same thing that Jesus was doing? And then the second question that I had was, had to do with in the passage of scripture, and we'll, we'll read it momentarily, where Jesus, where it describes this spirit that's been cast out. And the spirit is, is walking through dry places, and he's looking for a place to move back into, if we could say it that way. And then he finds that home where he was previous, it's, it's all swept out, and, and, the, and the King James Version says it's garnished. The idea there is that it's prepared. And he says, well, I'm just going to go back over there. And he brings six more with him. And the state of that man is worse than the way that it was before. So I think that whenever we're set, all said and done, that we're going to have a little bit of a better understanding of all of that. Now, going back to the question, why did we not see demons being cast out in the Old Testament, whereas in the New Testament, we suddenly see a plethora of demonic activity and Jesus taking authority over that uh, and casting out these demons. Well, first of all, I just want to say that whenever I look at the whole, the, the Bible as a whole, I, I've, a lot of times I try to find themes that, that run throughout the entirety of the Bible. And one of the main themes that I've found through the years is a concept called salvation history. Uh, Sometimes to do a wordplay, I'll say salvation, his story. Because mankind, you know, he chronicles history in various ways. Natural disasters, wars, rise and fall of empires. Well, when it comes to salvation history, God chronicles history according to his salvation plan. You know, the word of God starts with creation, where God creates a world where man can live upon it, but then... The, the fall of man takes place. And from that moment moving forward, God has been slowly but surely revealing his redemption or his salvation plan for fallen mankind. And so the further along we get with each new advent or new way that God reveals himself, the picture of salvation becomes more clear to the human race that was there before, or at least at the time frame that God does something new, mankind is able to see more clearly what God is doing. To where now we're in the church age, we have the Holy Spirit helping us. We can, if we put the time into study, we can look backwards and we can see much of what has taken place in the past, but we also see much of what is going to come in the future because the Lord gave us the book of Revelation. And he said, I'm here to show you things that have happened, things that are gonna that are taking place that are that are now, and things that will come in the future. So let's take that question again specifically. Why did we not see demons being cast out in the Old Testament? Well, where we were, this is the simple version of the answer, where we were in that time frame of salvation history, God was working through the nation of Israel and revealing his light to the heathen nations around Israel. His people Israel, as a collective body, had his spirit living with them, and as they traveled and journeyed, or as they inhabited the land, the other nations that they engaged with, whether it was through trade, whether it was through war, whether it was because they inhabited or some of the people groups were still left over, those nations were able to visibly see the nation of Israel. And that was God's plan. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, God said that when he brings them into the land and the foreigners of the land see the nation of Israel, that they will say to themselves, what great nation is there like this? Is there another great nation like this that has their God so close to them and what the, what God's plan was was that they would see the the other nations would, would be able to see the word of God and the law of God that had been given to Israel and that they would recognize 
that God is so close to them. Now, you got to understand, too, and that's one of the reasons that we built that foundation in the last few classes that we've taught before we get into the book of Daniel next week on Wednesday, is that these nations have been in darkness, spiritual darkness. They don't understand God. God is light, and until God's light enters into man or until God's light opens up the eyes of man, he is bound up in spiritual darkness. I don't think that we can really properly use words to describe how dark spiritually the world, it, it's, it's horribly dark now. But if, you could only, if we could only imagine how dark it was before Jesus, moving backwards, before the nation of Israel, moving backwards, before God called Abraham, the world was in chaos and disorder and in great darkness. And so through the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, we see instances, multiple instances really, of what I would say would be demonic possession. Not just demonic possession, but also demon spirits utilizing humanity in order to bring forward the plans of the enemy to try and where, where we're going to go in the end of the book of Revelation and where we went in Revelation 17 with the great harlot that we talked about is that to bring this world to a new world order under the dominion of Satan. That is the plan of the enemy. Don't, don't ever lose sight of that. The enemy is, he's got a plan. And he's been working his plan. And God's plan is to, is he is going to combat and he's going to overcome the works of Satan. And in the end, God wins. And, he, and, and the game is over already. The Bible says that you and I are seated in Christ in heavenly places. But nevertheless, God lets us engage the battle. And so again, that question, why about these demon possessions in the Old Testament. They were there. As a matter of fact, yesterday, last night, we talked about 1 Kings 18, and we talked about the prophet Elijah and his showdown with the prophets of Baal. We talked about the way that the prophets of Baal were acting and how they were behaving and how they were calling upon Baal to show up and to show his power. And in reality, what we know is, is that Baal is nothing more than a false god. He is basically demonic spirit, fallen angel, all these, however you want to view it. He's really Satan himself. Satan reveals himself and he changes his name. I want you, I want you to know that too. Because we're about to get into a couple of points that I want to make before we move forward in the scripture. But I want you to understand that when we get to Revelation 17 and we realize it says mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. And we remind ourselves when we started off in Babel about the, that was where the mystery religions began. We have to understand that through the ages, multiple harlots have been given birth to and have been on the earth from the mother of harlots. And again, you would have to go and watch the video we did last night, Revelation 17, talking about the harlot. And when we say that she's been producing offspring... What I want you to know is, is that that's why I wanted y'all to watch the video, the five-hour video of the man who was saved out of the occult. And he begins to show Freemasonry symbolism. And he begins to show you through pictures all of the people that are interconnected to that. And you can see pictures of young people like somebody as young as Michael Jackson all the way up until modern day music, I'm talking about Michael Jackson when he was a child, all the way up until modern day people, and they're doing all the same hand gestures, and they're, they're signaling one another as to what they're up to, and what that does is it shows you a space of time, yes, a very brief space of time, but a space of time nonetheless, that begins to allow the mind to realize that there's something bigger going on here, that for them to be making those same gestures it has to have it has to have meaning of some sort and i have to tell you that in my studies of the occult world when you begin all the way at the tower of babel and you start with the mystery religions and how they were spread to the west and also to the east and how the egyptians had mystery religions and how the canaanites had it and the romans and the and the and the grecians but look not only that 
it filtered into Judaism or into the Jewish nation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But then after that, you start to see the East come together with the West. We have the Knights Templar. That all of that stuff is shrouded in mystery religion. I don't have time to get into it in depth tonight, but you have the Knights Templar that ultimately becomes more modern days the Knights of Columbus. You have Rosicrucianism, which means rosy cross, which ultimately becomes the Red Cross. You have you have Jesuitism from Ignatius Loyola. You have all of these offshoots of all of Hinduism, Buddhism, and all of these things coming into effect. And what I want you to know is, is that yes, the Bible describes it as a female, a harlot in Revelation 17. But in reality, the father of all of this is the enemy himself. And as a matter of fact, when we read in the end of the book of Revelation, when we finally get there, we're going to realize that when God is done, when, when the enemy, I'm sorry, the enemy is done with this harlot, He's going to get rid of her because she it represents all the false religions that have existed, all the false ways, all the false doctrine, all the mystery, the, the, the mystery occultic organizations, the hidden hand that has been hiding the works of Satan upon the earth for all of these years, thousands of years of human history. The enemy is going to get rid of her because she's ultimately she's only in the way of what he really wants. And what he really wants is for himself to be worshipped. Now, I had to say all of that because, again, I want to remind you in the Old Testament, God is combating darkness. He's combating the false way through the nation itself. And he's revealing himself. But things are going to change when Jesus comes on the scene. And that's going to give us more clarity connected to why all of a sudden we begin to see these demons being casted out by Jesus. So a couple of things that I want to point out to consider. I want us to, to consider some concepts regarding the world that Jesus was born into. So that we can better understand some of the context specifically connected to Jewish exorcism. And we're about to read about that in the New Testament. And I think that that's one of the, one of the questions that was answered for me as I began to study and, and dig a little bit deeper about this concept of Jewish exorcism or just the word exorcism in general. Is it the same thing when we see demons being cast out by Jesus and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, is the word exorcism mean the same thing when we see it in modern Catholicism and we hear about exorcism? Is it the same thing as what we see in the New Testament? And I'm here to tell you that it's not. But let's we're going to dig a little bit deeper to try to make the point. Now, I want to I want to make a, a point here about Israel's association with Mystery Babylon, specifically the nation of Israel, God's people. There, first of all, I want to make this point that there. If you do a lot of research in this particular area, you will come across all kinds of information. And one of the things that I came across was extra biblical evidence that shows us that there seems to be an, a connection to where the children of Israel in the Exodus, when they left Egypt, brought in the multitude as they wandered in the wilderness. And this multitude of people brought with them some of these Egyptian mystery religions. All right. Now, it's not the Bible, so you can't prove it. I read a lot of information, but I'm going to let you know if, it's, if I'm not trying to preach this as the Bible. I can't prove what I just told you. In addition to that, there's other information that connects that ultimately, once the nation was established and the Pharisees, which is called the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which were like religious politicians, those are the ones that were fighting against Jesus when he, was, when he came into the world, that they were also engaged in this mystery religion, this Jewish form of mystery religion. Now, that would bring a whole new clarity to the idea of Jesus calling them vipers, Jesus telling them that their father was Satan, not just because their motives of their heart were wrong, but that they were really not even serving the God of Israel, but instead they had been polluted with the mystery religions of the days of old in the Old Testament. So while we can't prove this extra biblical information I just gave you, what we can prove from the scriptures is that Balaam in Numbers chapter 25 coerced Israel into 
were into engaging with the Moabite women, but then, but what was worse was they began to sacrifice the children of Israel, the men of Israel, began to sacrifice to the gods of the Moabite women. And Balaam, the false prophet, coerced them into that. And you can read about that in Numbers 23, 24, 25. But not only that, throughout the judges, the children of Israel worship false gods. Gideon chapter 6 shows us that. Throughout the kings, they worship false gods horribly. Solomon, Ahab. Okay, now, as we move forward to the history of Israel, what I want you to know is that a lot happens in this time frame known as the intertestamental period. 400 years took place between Malachi and and Matthew. We're about to get into it in the book of Daniel. But there were rise and falls of empires. The Assyrians overtook the northern kingdom. The Babylonians overtook the southern kingdom of Israel, which was known as Judah. The, the, after the Babylonians had risen in power, the Persians, which is modern day Iran, came in and defeated the Babylonians. After the Persians had elevated to power. We don't see a lot of this in the Bible. Daniel prophesied it. But after that, Alexander the Great came in and he conquered the known world. He overtook Persia. We don't and then and then in the time frame when Jesus is born, it's under Roman rule. The Romans are now in power because they ended up taking power from the from the Grecians. Now, one of the things that I brought all that up for was this is that during that intertestamental period, a lot happened to the nation of Israel. And I think it's important that we try to get some of this history down before we move forward to the passages. During this time frame, there was one particular leader. So Alexander the Great, Daniel prophesied this also, that Alexander the Great's kingdom was split into four. And one of the leaders down the road was named Antiochus Epiphanes or Epiphanes, however you want to say it. Antiochus, and we'll learn about him because the Bible talks about him when we get into Daniel and Revelation. Antiochus did some, some very wicked things to the nation of Israel. He focused a lot of his anger on the nation of Israel. And just real briefly, some of what he did was he offered up a swine on the altar. He made the children of Israel stop the sacrifices that were going on at the temple. He demanded that they quit circumcising their sons. He demanded that they could no longer read the Torah, which was the word of God. Now, what ended up happening from all of that is that because they couldn't worship in the temple, all of a sudden the synagogues started to spring up. So now there are synagogues all over the place, and within the synagogues, after Antiochus isn't in power anymore, and before the children of Israel have reestablished the temple properly, um, they begin to read the Torah in the synagogues, the Torah being the Old Testament. But now the idea is, is that the people don't understand, just like there are certain religions today say that the people can't understand the Word of God for themselves. And so you have teachers that are way up here, the people that are way down here. That's how the Sanhedrin came into existence. The Sanhedrin, again, being the Sadducees and the Pharisees that used to that were in conflict, they were the protagonists or the antagonists in the stories of the gospel, whereas Jesus was the protagonist, and they're coming against him because they have ought in their heart, they have envy in their heart, they're seeing the miracles he's performing, and they're concerned that he's going to take their place. Now, again, during this time frame, Jewish mysticism comes into existence. Again, let me just say that. During this time frame, we have written documents that show us this is where Jewish mysticism really begins to flower and really begins to come alive. In the 1300s now, in 1300 AD, it takes on a new name known as Kabbalah. Kabbalah is still alive today. It is a Jewish form of mysticism. It is not ancient Judaism that we read about that was the religion of God and the religion of the Jews and the religion that Jesus was born into when he told the Samaritan woman that salvation comes from the Jews. It's not the same thing. As a matter of fact, those Hasidic Jews that are at the Wailing Wall with the curly cues in their hair are not from true Judaism. They are part of mystical this Jewish mystery religion 
situation that's going on. So I want you to understand that when in the time frame, whenever Jesus is born into to this this scenario, this context in in Judah, when he's born in Bethlehem, this is all in existence. The Sanhedrin is in existence. The Sadducees, the Pharisees. Jewish mysticism is already in existence, and to be honest with you, it appears that Jewish exorcisms, the casting out of devils, was already in existence when Jesus came on the scene. So Jesus is the next step of the arrival of God's kingdom on the earth. And in this passage that we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 12, it shows us that the main reason that Jesus is casting out demons is to prove that he had all the power and the authority of the kingdom was resident on the inside of him. So that's really the answer to the question. Why didn't we see demons cast out in the Old Testament? Because God was moving and operating through the nation as a whole to reveal his power to the heathen nations around them. Why do we see Jesus casting out devils in the New Testament? Because the kingdom of God came to earth, resident in Jesus, and now when Jesus begins to cast out demons or devils on the earth, it begins to reveal to all everyone around that now that the power of the kingdom of God is now resident upon the earth and it shows that God's kingdom is more powerful than the kingdom of darkness and it also shows that Jesus has power over the kingdom of darkness. So that's the easy answer to the question. But let's go ahead and dig just a little bit deeper as we go into the passage of scripture. So I'm just going to read probably up until about verse 30. So we're in Matthew chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 22 and we're going to read up until about verse 30. It says, and we're talking about Jesus here. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil. The result of this was that he was blind and dumb. You know, isn't that just like the devil? He wants to cause everyone to be blind spiritually. He wants to, dumb means they could, he was a mute. He couldn't speak. Isn't that just like the devil? He wants us to be blind spiritually and unable to speak for God. So, but Jesus healed him. In so much that the blind and dumb both spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? We don't really have time to break that down, but most people that come to our church understand that that's a title to describe the Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. But when the Pharisees heard it, here they are. The Sanhedrin, the ones that got Jesus called vipers, the one that Jesus called, called them out and told them that their father was Satan himself. Here they are, the Sanhedrin, here they are, risen up in the intertestamental period, probably part of Jewish mysticism. When they heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils by, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So here Jesus cast this devil out. And again, you got it now. We got to understand that, that exorcisms were already going on. Okay. And now they're making a comment. This man is casting out a devil by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. Now I titled this message tonight, Demon Possession, Old and New. But then I put another little trailer onto the title. It said, Who Owns the House? And the reason that I want you to that I brought that up is, is because the word house is used at least three different times in this passage of scripture, starting with Beelzebub. The name Beelzebub started off as the Lord of the dumb, then it changed into the Lord of the flies, I'm talking about in history. And if you look it up in the, in the Strong's Greek Dictionary right here, if you looked it up in the Strong's Greek Dictionary, I can try to, I can try to, to uh, magnify this for you. You see that, that word right there? Beelzebub. You might not be able to see it too good. It's one of the names of Satan. Look what it says right here. It says, <laughs> the name of Satan, but look, the Lord of the house. You see that? The Lord of the house. So basically what's being said here is that Belze it, 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 the name Beelzebub describes the Lord of the house. What kind of house are we talking about? Well, so many times in the New Testament, the body is described as a house. And we're going to see that as we move forward. So 
He's, the, the, the Pharisees claim that Jesus is casting out devils by the power of the devil himself. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Now, I want to just stop for a moment and I want us to kind of think about this for a second. Because as we move forward, some of the thoughts that I'm going to give you to, to, for you to process in your own mind is, is Jesus saying right here that Satan would never allow a devil to be casted out? I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think the main point that Jesus is saying is a couple of things. Number one, Satan and I aren't working together. I'm against him and he's against me. Number two, Satan is not going to purposefully do something that's going to bring division to his kingdom any more than God is going to purposefully do something to bring division to his kingdom. But that does not mean that if it works for Satan that he would not allow a demon to be expelled if it would only help his cause. Well, how can something like that help his cause? Okay, here's an example. This man was bound by demons and he was possessed. The man of Gadarene was bound by demons and he was possessed. People in the area knew that these people were possessed. If somebody comes and he's casting out devils and showing power that doesn't come from God Almighty, then now the people begin to look to that and more people can be deceived because they're looking to that power source instead of the power source that comes from God. Now I'm about to prove to you through the scriptures that this was going on. But I want to I want to introduce you to the thought right now and I want us to deal with this passage of scripture. I don't believe that Jesus is saying that that uh, that the devil will never allow a demon to be cast out as long he will allow it and if it works for him he will encourage it but he will never purposefully try to bring division within his own kingdom so i hope that you can understand where i'm coming from that right there which so then chapter, jesus which chapter? this is matthew chapter 12 and we are still in matthew 12 and that that verse right there was um verse 25 and then now we're moving in, in verse 25 and 26. And now we're moving into 27. And then he says this. Jesus says this. And this is the point whenever earlier I gave the easy answer to the question that was asked in church. Why all of a sudden, why didn't we see demon, demons cast out in the Old Testament? And then why all of a sudden when Jesus shows up on the scene do we see all these demons cast out? And what the main concept I told you was this, because God wanted to show the world that Jesus had power over the forces of evil. That's good news for you. That's good news for me. Because Jesus later on says in the book of Luke that he's given us power to tread on scorpions and serpents. You might need to do a little research, but what Jesus is talking about right there is that he's given us power over demonic spirits. And the reason why he wants to give us power over demonic spirits is because he does not want the forces of evil to have more power than what we do so that you and I can be filled with the Holy Ghost and to move forward in the land and to tell the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that other people can know the truth and be set free. But look, this is Jesus saying it in his own words right here. He says, if I by Beelzebub, the Lord of the house, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? So this was one of the questions that I asked in the beginning of the teaching. So were the Jews casting out devils or not? And what I'm trying, what I explained to you in that interim period of the of the intertestamental time, I believe that's when it all started. I believe that when this Jewish mysticism stuff started taking place, that a lot of things were already happening whenever Jesus showed up on the scene, and that exorcisms were taking place. And again, I want to make the point. That exorcism is not the same thing as Jesus casting out a devil. Exorcism is not the same thing as the Apostle Paul casting out a devil. He says, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But look, Jesus is about to get more clear. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon unto you. There's the answer to the question. 
for, for the gentleman in the church that asked the question, that that is the answer. Jesus said it right here. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is proof that Jesus has power over the forces of evil. This is proof for the people to see the glory and the power of God working and operating. This is proof to reveal to the people that Jesus, the kingdom of God, has come become resident on the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 29, he says this, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his goods. This is further clarification that Jesus has power over the forces of evil. And listen, in that scripture before, in verse 28, Jesus said that if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Resident in Jesus, in his person, was the power to cast out demons. Now, in this verse here, in verse 29, if you can read it right there, I want, I want us to consider this. How is Jesus going to get that power to us? Because that's the plan of God for the church. That, that God would get the power that Jesus had into us. Well, he did that when he died on the cross. If you don't believe me, you'll need to write it down if you have your pen and paper. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. He took authority and he gave us freedom from the power of principalities and powers and the forces of evil through what he did at the cross. That's what that scripture says, Colossians 2, 14 and 15. But Jesus is saying, how can one enter into a strong man's house? There's the idea of house again. The Lord of the house. How can Jesus, how can someone enter into a man's house? It's an illustration that describes if you're going to overtake someone's possessions, you have to bind him first. The strong man of this house or this earth right now, according to Jesus, he, he refers to Satan in the Gospel of John as the prince, the arche, which means one of the first ones, and it describes a chief, it describes a person in leadership and authority. Jesus recognizes Satan in this time frame where we are right now, before he's thrown into the bottomless pit, before he will ultimately be thrown into Gehenna as a powerful source to be reckoned with upon this earth. But the reason that Jesus came was to, to take the power away from the enemy and to give you an I power. Now, the enemy still has power today, but you and I, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. How can you enter into a strong man's house and spoil his good, except his goods, except you first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. So if this is the house of the enemy, and, and Jesus is coming in here to bind the strong man, so that now you and I can work while it is day to accomplish the will of God. And then he goes on to say this in verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters abroad now i don't want to get into that too deep but i believe that he's trying to make the point that he's of another kingdom of what the enemy's in and he's of another kingdom jesus is in another kingdom of what the enemy's in obviously but jesus is also in another kingdom of the way the pharisees are, are operating and he's making that decision that that distinction and he's showing if you're not with me you're against me all right now i want to go back to my notes just for a second and I want us to take a look at Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Now we're going to Acts chapter 19, verse 13. And if you remember this story, this was another, uh, this was another story of demons being expelled and this was already going on. This is happening in the books of, book of Acts. But I just want you to try to consider the context with me for a second. It says in verse 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews. Now just real quick, let's go ahead and take a look at one more uh, Bible version, the ESV. It says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. You see that word there? I'm going to go back to the King James Version, but I want to focus just for a second on vagabond and itinerant. 
An itinerant person is a person that's traveling around. Kind of like in the old days, doctors would carry their doctor bag and they would go make house calls. The concept here is, is that these vagabond or itinerant Jews are journeying. They're journeying from house to house or town to town, wherever they're needed in order to perform an exorcism. You might not have even known it, but the word exorcist is in the Greek New Testament. Now let's take a look <coughs> excuse me, at this word in the, in the Strong's Greek Dictionary. I want us to pay kind of close attention. I'm going to try to blow it up for you as best I can so that you can see it. The word in the Greek right there, the way you would pronounce this if you were going to try to pronounce it in, in English would be like ekor kistes, ekor kistes, which is a transliteration. Now, I'm not trying to get all deep on you, but I kind of am. A transliteration is when you take one letter from the Greek and you turn it into a, another letter in English and then you end up with a word. So we end up with the word exorcist from the transliteration of ekorkistas. But what I want you to see now, I want you to look at the, I want you to look with me at the definition because this was very powerful for me. Because this does not sound like the same thing that Jesus is doing. This does not sound like the same thing that the Apostle Paul is doing. So I'm making the point right now, exorcism is not the same thing as casting out a demon in the power and authority that is given unto us through Jesus Christ who, gave, who was given to this, this darkened world by the Father. Now let's look at this, this, um, this definition. It says, one that binds by an oath or a spell. By implication, an exorcist, a conjurer. Now, if you look up the word conjurer in an American dictionary, it's going to tell you one that casts a spell. This right here is describing some type of magic. So, in reality, let's back up and let's go back to Matthew chapter, chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Where or, or verse 27, where, where Jesus talked about the fact that Satan would not divide himself. But in this case, it sounds like maybe Satan could be working within himself. See, one of the things that I've learned about the devil as I've studied the Bible and about the occult world is that there's layer upon layer of deception to the point where after you've peeled back thousands of layers, you still got more layers to go. And this is not surprising to me at all once I saw it because that's how the devil works he's not dividing his kingdom he's working within his own kingdom and he's causing more confusion and people don't understand so it says again he who extracts an oath of one one who employs a formula of conjuration one who employs a formula of conjuration For expelling demons. You see it right there. Now, already, just by reading that definition, anybody that's been in the faith for any length of time, you already ought to be saying, this does not sound the same as what Jesus did and what the Apostle Paul was doing. But let's go ahead and let's, let's dig a little bit deeper right here. I want to show you something I found. Look at his website right here. I'm about to click on it and it should show up on the screen. Look at it. This is a modern day website. Look what, look what it says. It says, Kabbalistic amulets. You know what an amulet is, right? We've talked about it in the church sometimes. An amulet is a little symbol. Some people wear a little crystal around their neck. And it's an occultic symbol. And the, uh, the amulet is considered to be a focal point where a source of inner occultic energy can be displaced and that power can be harnessed in order to accomplish something in the spiritual realm. Now, this is in no way, shape, or form having anything to do with God. So it says it right there, Kabbalistic amulets. I'm not trying to show the old boy's name right there. But look, Jewish exorcism. You see that? And all of this, that actually looks like that's a picture of the, of the enemy himself right there on that little placard or whatever that is. Let me just read to you real quick some of this. Jewish exorcism, now this is a modern day 
website where you can go buy amulets to dispel demon spirits, to exercise demon spirits. I don't know how much more clear we can get with the problem that we're dealing with here and to bring clarity to the scripture that we're reading in Acts 19. It says, Jewish exorcism practices take root in an age-old, well-tested tradition that discerns between several different negative influences that require such treatment. It has been known that the world is full of spiritual beings, some of which are here to test us, some are just part of this world. Those can be demons or restless souls which can attach themselves to human beings and interfere with their lives, causing harm in many ways. He goes on to talk about this Talmudic source, which is the Talmud is wrapped up in Mystery Babylon also. And these amulets, these sources of focal point of energy, it says right here, also those and other negative influences can be driven off and healed by going through a series of Jewish exorcism rituals. Let me just blow that up for you because I, I don't want to spend too much time here because I'm about to wrap this up. But look, Jewish exorcism rituals right there. Can't see it. Can't see it? There it is. A little bit bigger? Can you see that? It's bright, too bright. Okay, it's too bright. Sorry about that. Well, that's what it says. Jewish exorcism rituals. Their help is addressed both at the problem and its source both the possessed and the possessor. So I think that I kind of like was able to make the point that I wanted to make that in Mystery Babylon, the mother of Harlot has produced all types of things. And one of the things that she produces is Jewish mysticism. And that exorcism is not the same thing as expelling demons. But look, let's just go ahead and read the story because it even gets better. And we're just going to go ahead and read through. These exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what I believe is going on here is the fact that previously they were exercising these demon spirits the way that they were doing it according to Jewish mysticism. Whether they were using these amulets, whether they were, they were going through a series of requiring I guess the way that I would describe it, the way I'm understanding it is, since they're having to, they're, they're, they're making, it sounds like to me, they're making these demon spirits take an oath. You read that with me, right? You saw that. That, you're gonna, they're, that they're trying to make them take an oath that they would agree based upon some formula or some spell to, to agree with them that, that this thing would come out. Why? Again, for a, for a greater purpose, so that the people would be deceived even further, so that they, would, that they would begin to believe that these people had the power of God, when in reality, they didn't have the power of God. They were actually, they were the ones, basically, make a long story short, they were the ones that were casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. They were the ones that were working a deal, negotiating a deal with these demon spirits to create something, another layer of deceit to pull people in. This is what they said. But, but then they changed their tactic and they, they desired to employ the name of Jesus. Why? Because they saw Paul doing it and the word was getting out. And so they thought that they could do that. And they said it right here. They said, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. That word adjure, I'm not going to click on it to save time, but that word adjure means to cause someone to take an oath. So they're talking to the demon spirit. This is what they do, the exorcist. They work some kind of a formula, some kind of a conjuring spell that requires the demon to negotiate and to agree with some type of an oath. And that's what they're saying. We need you to take the oath. But then they make the mistake of using the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one named Sceva. Now, you can't make this stuff up, but if you look up his name in the Strong's Dictionary, it actually describes it, it says that his name is a variant that comes from Latin and means left-handed. Now, I'm not trying to get over, overwhelmed you with information. I know I do it a lot. The Bible talks about extending the right hand of fellowship. Right describes righteous or de dexter, left in the old Latin language was sinister. 
the occult uses the left hand. They extend the left hand of fellowship. His name in Latin meant left hand. But in addition to that, his name meant mind reader. I can't make this stuff up. It's just there. I study it. There it is. What I'm trying to say is that Skuva, Skiva was a Jew, and he was the chief of the priests, and that they were he was performing exorcisms. His seven sons were going around performing Jewish exorcisms. So what that tells me is that this is proof that that the Pharisees and the religious leaders were involved in Jewish mysticism brings a whole other level to Jesus telling them that their father is the devil, brings a whole other level of him calling them vipers. Now look at this. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. I want you to see that. This was made known to all the Jews and all the Greeks. Now, the Grecian, the Grecian people were all caught up in mystery religion. Mythology, Hercules, Apollo, Adonis, all of that, right? They were, and fear fell on all of them. Well, look what happened. Whenever they saw the power of... Of the, of the works of Satan jump upon these men that were trying to operate and trying to disguise themselves as true men of God. And then they also heard what Paul had been doing. Um, the, the name of Jesus became magnified. And look, many that believed came and confessed. They confessed what they had been doing, and they showed their deeds. They allowed it to come into the light so that it would be exposed. Many of them also which used curious arts. Let's stop there. Let's look at the ESV. I don't know if you can see it very well because of the highlight. Let me see if I can get rid of that highlight for you. Uh, curious arts. What this is actually saying is those that practice. I think I put a double on this one. Uh, those that practiced. I don't know why this is giving me such a hard time. I'm just trying to get it to where you can read it. Those that practiced magic arts. They brought their books together. They burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. It, what an amazing thing. The occult, this is what I'm getting out of this. The occult world, which looks more like white magic, is trying to cast out demons that looks more like black magic, but they try to use the name Jesus in the midst of it, and the demon spirits are like, no, we ain't going to take no oath on that deal because you don't walk in that authority and that power, and instead we're going to overcome you and overwhelm you. So that's what I believe just happened right there. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to try to close up where we were before. So we ended on verse 30, where Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, we're not teaching this tonight, but just in passing, I'll say, this is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Whenever a person attributes the work of God to Satan. Now, i got to tell you, I believe, as I've studied the occult, I believe that there are literally preachers on big networks like TBN that are literally in the occult. You can do what you want with that. You can pull your hair out, throw dust in the air. You can say whatever you want to say. I believe that. I'm not going to sit here and start naming off their names. That's not necessarily my job at this point in time or what I feel led to do. But what I'm saying is I honestly believe that. But I'm very careful whenever I say that because I don't want to attribute the works of Satan to the work of God. But that's what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Then he transitions into the concept of a tree is known by its fruit. I'm just going to have to read it to you because I'm not going to have time to get the highlight off of there. 
Jesus says, to, he's still talking to the Pharisees, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Then he says, it. verse 34, Matthew 12, verse 34, you brood of vipers, that's a poisonous snake. I mean, how we talked about it last night. We've been talking about it. How much of a theme is there in the word of God connected to a serpent that turns into a dragon connected to a viper which is a poisonous snake and he's injecting people with false doctrine of poison that is causing death to their spiritual walk he said you brood of vipers how can you speak good when you are evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks how can they do it Jesus knew how they could do it Paul knew how they could do it. Paul wrote about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a different Jesus. It's a different spirit. It's a different gospel. That's how they do it. Because out of one side of their mouth, they speak a lie. And out of the other side of their mouth, they speak a truth. And it causes great confusion. Jesus says, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good fruit. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of them, we talked about this last night, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him and saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, real quick, what kind of signs does the modern church seek after? I talked about it last night. They, they, they're looking for people to blow on people, people to fall down, wave their coats, people to fall down. They consider this to be some, they're looking for people to jerk and to shake and to do all this kind of stuff. They're looking for signs and wonders. People run to and fro. They get in lines to see signs and wonders. Jesus said that the sign that he was going to show them was going to be the sign of Jonah the prophet. Well, what was the sign of Jonah the prophet? Jonah, the sign of Jonah the prophet was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. The sign that God, Jesus, gave to the world to, to bring people into the kingdom of God was the fact that he died on the cross, he was buried in the tomb for three days and three nights, and he resurrected from the dead. And if you will believe that, my friend, if you will take the chance and believe God at his word and accept that Jesus that I'm preaching right there, that Jesus that died on the cross for your sin and that was buried in the tomb for three days and three nights and resurrected on the third day, if you will believe in that Jesus and invite him into your heart, you will be transformed. The inside of your house will be transformed and the Holy Spirit will come to live on the inside of that house and that house will now belong to God. He goes on to say this in verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now he goes back to the unclean spirit. He cast that spirit out. They said, oh, you, you cast out spirits by the prince of, uh, by the, by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. You, pray. you cast out devils by the Lord of the house. And then Jesus said, no, I've come to bind the strong man so that we can take the spoils of his house. But here we go back again, the unclean spirit. He says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, now, now we're going to use the concept of Jewish exorcism right here. Because they're accusing Jesus of working with the prince of Beelzebub. And we just established what that was. That whole exorcism thing that took place in Acts 19 I, don't, I hope I can't convince you any more than I just tried. But Jesus said that when the spirit has gone out of a person, I never understood this before, but now I understand it so much better. It passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. That water, that water thing is descriptive of dry ground. Some scholars in the past have stated that the demon spirits like the water. We don't have time to really get into what that means. But nevertheless... Then it says this. Who says it? The demon spirit. I will return to my house. Is that not the most amazing? That's the first time I ever saw that. 
I had it highlighted. I wanted to point it out. The demon spirit said, I'm going to return to my house. Well, whose house? That, that you, you, you felt like you owned that house? He, that's what he felt like. The demon spirit felt like he owned that house, and that's where he was living. Now, all that foundation that I brought you through in Nephilim 1 and Nephilim 2 to make the point that demon spirits are the disembodied spirits of the giants of old that were the hybrid mix between the fallen angels and the daughters of men. Now you see why we got to have some understanding of these things so that we can understand why would a demon spirit want a house so bad because they used to live in the vessel of those giants wreaking havoc and bringing forth the plans of the kingdom of darkness now they've died now their spirits are loosed and so they're looking for a new house to live in but in modern day times or in the new testament times once they were cast out whether it was through this jewish exorcism before jesus came they're looking for a place to live he says i will return to my house from which i came and when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. So the idea here is, is that a, a Jewish exorcism might be able to drive out through conjuring and a spell and creating some formula and making them take an oath. It might be able to tell that demon to leave, but it cannot put the Holy Spirit back in a vessel. See, that's why demon spirits and the Holy Spirit don't live in the same vessel. People can tell you whatever they want, deliverance ministry, that. I believe in praying deliverance. I believe in the prayer of deliverance. I believe in, 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 in spiritual warfare through prayer. But Christians are not possessed, my friend. They might be heavily oppressed. But with the work of Je that Jesus did at the cross is enough to liberate them and to set them free if they will joint participate and agree with the Holy Ghost and that God will give the victory and will give power over the works of Satan. But one thing that Jewish exorcism, Jewish mysticism, other exorcisms cannot do is to put the Holy Spirit back on the inside of that vessel. And so when that demon spirit sees that house is empty, he says this. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to bring with me seven other spirits, more evil than myself. And then they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. That's all I have tonight. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Father, I thank you for this beautiful plan that you've given us, that you brought light, the light of men from heaven, to dispel the darkness upon this earth. Lord, this earth world that we're living in is full of darkness. It's so much more dark than what we can really see. The darkness is being shrouded and it's being hidden, hidden within the mystery religions. But Lord, your word desires to be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. I pray for your body, Lord. I pray for the body of Christ across this globe. I pray specifically for our church, Lord. I pray for the churches in this community. I pray, Lord God, that you would open up the eyes of your people that they would be able to see. I pray that you would open up the ears of your people that they would be able to hear. I pray that you would give us the spirit of discernment that we would be able to see what the works of the enemy are up to and that we would be reminded that he that is in us, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, because we accepted Jesus. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. We thank you, Jesus, for defeating the principalities and powers on the cross, according to Colossians 2, 14 and 15. We thank you, Jesus, according to Luke 10, that you gave us power to tread on scorpions and serpents. I pray that you would fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Not that we would have a better church service, but that we would move and operate in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to let those that are in darkness know that you are here, the light of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless.